Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, you're very welcome to this afternoon's masterclass, masterclass coming to you virtually from the National Concert Hall in Dublin as part of the International Master Course. And while we're very sorry that we're not able to present this event in person, we are nonetheless delighted to have you with us wherever you are around the world, uh, where we are very happy to welcome the wonderful cellist Mark Coppy for this afternoon's masterclass. Mark, you're very, very welcome, and it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, we would have loved to host you in Dublin, uh, but uh, we hope to have you back uh, in person, hopefully in the very near future. Hello, everybody, and thank you very much. Uh, today's masterclass uh, will take uh, the following format. We will have three participants, and uh, we will hear from two of these participants initially. Each one will have approximately 40 minutes. Um, after the second participant, we will take a very short break, um, just about three minutes, and then we will conclude with our, fourth, with our third and final participant before having a short question and answer session. So we would encourage you, uh, if you are watching, and if you would like to ask Mark a question, please uh, use the chat facilities of our Facebook and YouTube channels to send your questions into us, and we will relay them to Mark for the question and answer session at the end of uh, the masterclass. Um, as I said, we have, uh, we have three uh, participants with us today, and I'll introduce them uh, in one minute. But first of all, just recognizing uh, Mark, and uh, thank you again for being with us. Mark is recognized for his celebrated interpretations as a soloist and his extensive exploration of chamber music, and his, uh, also his dedication to widening the cello repertoire. And Mark is indeed considered to be one of the world's leading cellists, and we are very happy to have him with us today. We will hear, first of all, from Alina Mayer Whitla. And Alina is an undergraduate student studying in Music Academy Basel with Thomas Domenga. And today she will present Bach's Suite Number no. 3 in C major. Then we will hear from Catherine Cotter, who is a student of Christopher Marwood in the Royal Irish Academy of Music. And today she is going to play the Beethoven's Cello Sonata Number no. 5 in D major, first movement. And then our third participant is Alona Kluczka, and she is a cellist born in Ukraine and got her bachelor's degree at Moscow State University, sorry, Moscow State Conservatory. She got her master's degree at the Hague Royal Conservatoire, and she has just finished a course at University of Limerick with tutors from the Irish Chamber Orchestra. And Alona will play Gaspar Casado Cello Suite First Movement in the masterclass today. We do hope that you enjoy the session and uh, we hope that you stay with us throughout and keep an eye on our website, nch.ie, for all of the other sessions in this year's International Master Course. So if I could ask if Alina is there, um, Alina, can you please switch your mic and camera on and uh, we will commence proceedings. Alina, hi Alina, you're very, hi. very welcome. Uh, how are you today? I'm very well, thank you, Harry. Good. And you are tuning in from? From Cork. From Cork. Good. Excellent. OK, Mark, I will leave you uh, with Alina and I will see you in, in approximately 40 minutes and I hope you enjoy the session. So, um, hello, Alina. So I heard you're playing Bach C major suite. Do you want to play several movements? What 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 did you plan in your program? Um, well, I have the whole suite, but in the interest of time, maybe um, I've picked three. So I have the prelude, the allemande, and the bourrées. Okay, let, let's go for that. Okay. Maybe without repeats, considering the yeah. short time, unfortunately. Okay. Okay. Thank you. 
circumstances in front of a camera and I think you are doing very well with a lot of energy and, and, and a lot of uh, nice ideas as far as phrasing. There are a lot of things that you do that, that I find quite imaginative and interesting and, and lively. Uh, the thing I would focus on, which is not easy because of this setting, but I have the feeling that the quality of, the, of your sound is something you should work on. Uh, whenever we play a lot of separate bows, on the cello, especially on the modern cello. If you play with baroque bow, with god strings, a lot of separate bows, it sounds a certain way. On the middle string, especially when you press a lot on, on those strings, there is, as far as I can hear on, from here, some kind of saturation of the sound. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and it's not really homogeneous, your, your, your sound. So you want to probably to produce some <laughs> character and, and, and some powerful sound, which I have nothing against, of course, but I think you should always do that in a way that keeps the resonance of the instrument. This is a music that is based a lot on that. So, of course, this is symbolized by this first, this first C. And I think it should rather ring than, than being pressed. You know what I mean? Yeah. The kind of power that you use. You, you can make it maestoso, powerful, and, and full of energy and, and sound. I am absolutely fine with that. This is very much the character of that suite. It should sound very open and quite powerful, actually, quite maestoso. It's all meant for that. The, all this wonderful C major chord. I mean, what better key can we have on the cello? But you tend to, some of your beta shade tend to not breathe enough. And then, so that, that's just a matter of sound quality that I think you should care for more. Yeah. Sometimes the sound is quite good and sometimes it's not as good. Simply probably also because you play quite good frog. Maybe do you want a lot of pressure there? You feel more pressure, more weight? This is what you want? Mm -hmm. But then you have to be careful with the fact that the bow there is not very flexible. All this first third of the, of the bow is, is a bit stiff. Whenever you play a bit further away on the bow, yeah, I don't know if you see on my... Yeah, yeah. You see? Okay. I think you should make exercises of separate bows in different, in different places where you manage 
to have a more even sound and also see what is the best place on the bow to play all these separate notes. So that they ring, they don't... I don't know if you hear the difference with microphone, it's quite difficult yeah, to no, tell. definitely. You see what I mean? So, because sometimes I hear you sound with a lot of uh, air and, and, and nice quality and sometimes I hear, I hear these bow changes and these, these things which are not as with such a good quality of sound. Then the other aspect, which is apart from the sound quality thing, but which has to do more with the organization of the music, is that whenever you play separate bows, you have to wonder more about the organization of them. So they don't become individual notes. Whenever we play motifs, especially in the prelude, but not only, but especially in the prelude, we play chords, we play scales, we play longer units. When you play... Whether I separate or slur it, that's a choice, and I agree with you that a lot of them should be separate, but they shouldn't be... Let's say they shouldn't be separate. They should have different bows, which is not the same thing. Separate yes. is not a nice thing. They should be linked, on the contrary. Mm -hmm. Imagine you are playing the, a, a, key, a, a keyboard. I can play articulated, or I can play legato. But whether it's legato or whether it's articulated doesn't change the fact that this is only one chord. You see? For instance, this is just one chord. Another chord. So how many notes do I play or how many chords do I play? This is something sometimes I think you should wonder. Just simply as we have what we have in the pre the first suite. We have 16 notes, but only one chord. And especially we string players having a lot of motions with our bow, we should always be careful with that. that the bow motion don't become actual musical harmonical motions. That's something completely different. We articulate with the bow, but the, the harmonical unit is another thing. You see what I mean? And I think that should also help your sound. Maybe you don't relate that to the sound. I think it would relate it to the sound because you would phrase differently and group differently. Can we do from the beginning, maybe? Make it ring. Yeah. Okay. I like your first note. I think your first note really to my ear here. It's it rings, but then. The ideal of sound of a cello. What is it? What is the what is the best sound we have? What are the best sounding notes on the cello? The Would you open strings, Absolutely. The open strings. And by the way, you know what, what the prelude is for originally? A prelude is meant to tune. Right? The sweet suite of dances. Sweet means suite of dances, right? Mm -hmm. So in a way, the, the suite starts, starts there. The prelude is a prelude, right? It's an introduction. I don't know if you can say that in English. In French, we have a verb for it. We can say to prelude, right? I'm preluding. Uh, yeah. right? So you are preluding. And preluding means you are actually tuning your instrument in the most musical way. You hear that sometimes with, with harpsichord players or lute players. They check that all the chords of the, in, on the instrument are actually nicely sounding, and so they have to modulate, they have to change keys, but they check. So when we play the first suite, the second, and the third, you actually play the is some kind of tonal exploration of the instrument, right? Then the fourth suite is something else. We go on the, on the more difficult 
territories as far as sound. But when can you play those four open strings with the as much resonance as you want, as you can, right? Just those four notes. You can do better. Take time to to see in order to get the best sound out of all every one of them, how you have to change the contact slightly. Mm -hmm. The last one, it can be deeper. Be necessarily stronger, deeper. Rather than the pressure of the string. No? You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. You don't need to actually press. You have to feel weight on it. And as much as possible, the right arm. Or the amplitude of your arm. You could use more of the weight. Cellist that you probably know, Anner Bilsma, the Baroque cellist. He always was saying, on the C string, you have to ask gently. Okay. So in a way, you can be strong on the C string, but you have to you have to be a little bit more gentle to the string, and it will give you better. Okay. Try that. The very beginning, when you start the vibration, care for that moment. Like, you see? So all the other notes, the notes which are not open string, they should sound with more resonance. The kind of resonance you have on the open string. That's not easy. It's basically impossible, by the way. But we try to make it. I think the sound is already more, is breathing more. Now, just one simple cello thing. When you change string, make sure there's no accent. Anticipate more your change, like if it was only one string. Okay. Then I have a question for you. When you play those scales, do you hear the chords which are behind, which are below that those, those scales? Yeah, which is part. Maybe that's why I was accenting some of them. Yes. Are you sure that you know exactly when the harmony changes? Can you stop when the harmony changes? Yeah. From here. Still C major? No. Uh, there, there's a new chord. C major. You see? So be aware where exactly it does change. Does it change on the D or on the on the on the D? You you tend to accentuate the note of the, the base of the chord, but the, the, the base of the chord is not the moment when the harmony has changed. The harmony has changed on one beat before. <laughs> I'm of course overdoing it, yeah. but uh, it's not. Um, the energy and the dynamics go more with the harmony than you do, I think. Can you? Thank <laughs> you.
Much better. I understand much more. Then you can be more free with the flow of the the waves of the music. You can feel more the phrasing going up, going down. Just to phrase as much as you can. Now we enter what? Now we enter a beautiful harmonic march. That I would like to hear more. Of. Yeah. Then what you should think of is these are all sixteenths, right? But it, are they actually all sixteenths? No. It's maybe not as it seems. Eight. Yes. Oh, yeah. You know that, but you don't do it too much. <laughs> Otherwise, it's all 16, all 16, it becomes a bit mechanical. <laughs> Feel eighth notes, not sixteenth. change the tempo but you, you you bring some different grouping of the notes then we enter there's a paradox you know the major preludes we have a lot of time in minor and the and the minor prelude we have a lot of time in, in major make us hear that <laughs> It's darker. Once again, I would ask you, I'm not going to ask you all the prelude like that, but make sure you always exactly know where the bass is changing. For instance, the color of your F to me it doesn't feel it has the support of the bass. Can you do that? Absolutely, the chord is teaching you the color of the sound. Okay, and make sure to me you're always a little bit too much here to make the separate bows. Try. We have a beautiful sound. And, and don't you feel more free with your arm? It's different, yeah. This. Just, you know, the, the, the ease to move the arm. Mm -hmm. it, here, it's a bit heavy. Mm -hmm. You have two problems here. The arm is heavier to move and the bow is stiffer. I'm not saying you should never play there. It depends what you play, of course. But in these, it's not very expressive because I cannot really freely phrase. You see? 
I'm afraid we have to go to the to the next moment, otherwise we won't have time. Um, just as a little piece of information, you know that the end of that prelude, there is the signature of Bach. You know where there is signature of Bach? In the chords. Yes. So which one is B? B, B, A, H, C, H. I believe this is why he makes trill with the six, which is very unusual. Double trill on the cello is quite problematic, by the way. He does that on his name. So, by the way, this is easier. If you try first finger on the B, and then no. Second on E, isn't it? Exactly. Apparently, I'm not speaking loud enough, so I will speak louder. Um, I know it's a bit weird at first, but I think it proves to be easier and more realistic. You will, you will get used to it. And I don't think it is relevant to, to restart the trill, because in a way, the beginning of the trill is... The beginning of the trill is al has already started before. Okay. okay, that's a little detail. Can we do a bit of Almond? <laughs> do you know the characteristic of the Almond? Yeah, it's a, like a dance, and Almond is like French for German. Yeah, and it is sometimes quite. Uh, in that case, quite um, quite dancing, sometimes not particularly, by the way. Uh, when we play, it is more melodic. But there is, of course, a rhythmical structure, which is always in four. This is what I'm heading to with you. I don't hear your four beats. Okay. And because this movement can be quite square. This is not the most fun, uh, there's not, not much fantasy in that movement. If you compare to uh, the element of the second suite, or of course, we see how different Allemand can, can be, right? But there's one thing in common always is the rhythmical structure. And I think it becomes sometimes more interesting, especially in that one, when you relate more to the rhythmical structure, because then you realize that some of the harmony changes don't necessarily happen where you think they happen. What I mean is that one, two, three, four. So you have a paradox. You have the bass on the upbeat. Not, you don't, you don't sit on that, you see? So, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Not, one, two, one, two, three. You see what I mean? It helps you feeling longer lines and not necessarily accentuating as we think it is accentuated. Can we try that? To, just to feel the four bar, the four beats. Mm -hmm. I feel down beats everywhere, everywhere. Just as an exercise, can you try 
Many boings possible, but it's just interesting to not always play downbeats everywhere. This one you can go down, it's very natural. It's like two, three, four, not one, two, three, four. That, that kind of a feeling, you see? Then whether you do it with different bowings, that's, we don't have time to necessarily develop that. But what I mean is make sure you really play accordingly to the four beats of the album. The rest of it, there's a lot of freedom in that, but that's the rhythmical structure you have to connect to it because this is dance. articulation and in a way I like it with one limit it, when you when you try to when you do that kind of yeah are you sure you want that that much maybe not as much you see what I mean yeah. if I like that you don't play you don't have to play them even you're right with that it's interesting to phrase them but to make yada ta da da ta ta yadi, that's a little bit over the top to me. That sounds a bit like uh, Edith Piaf songs, you see. Ta da ta da ta ta. It's a little bit uh, lacking elegance in a way. Because that's a counter accentuation. So, when uh, counter accentuation, we can use them, of course but we have to be aware that this is not necessarily in the character of such, an, uh, such a dance, right? Um, and try to oppose, not to oppose, but differentiate. Okay. Difference, try the second half. Fingering. If you do that booing, yes, yes. Yeah. This, that's fine. This is the connection, you know, the connection between booings and articulation. This is not a bad booing. This is not a bad fingering, but they don't connect together. If I do, it's fine. That doesn't look good. Make sure you connect correctly booings and fingering. speak of the variety of articulation, I think in your case they could connect more to the harmony. If I do, there's the vigor and, and the joy of this G major, but because basically the articulation in this movement is the same. Pa, 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 it's the same motive. So why do I vary it? It's mainly for harmonical reason. It becomes softer, sadder, whatever you want to call it. So A 
avoid the crescendo. That doesn't go with, with uh, an Allemande. Okay. And make sure. You could lighten it with your, a, a bow. Listen carefully. Ta da 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 pa pa da 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 pa 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 ta ta. I hear the bow there. See the difference? Yeah. That's just an example to make sure we don't do more sound, less sound for bow reason. But really because you want it musically. We have very little time. I just your your Bourré has a lot of character which I like. We have a bit of the same question. Make sure you have the ringing sound in the bass. Strong, forte, I like that, but ringing rather than pressed. And you know the, the accentuation of the bourré. What is the characteristic of it? Um, well, the, in this one, there's two different ones. The first one is like light and, and happy, and the second one is more. Um, yeah, of course, between the first and the second bourré. But I mean, rhythmically, what is the characteristic of a bourré? Um, in two. Yes, in two. But you know the, the difference of accentuation of bars? Like in two, over two bars? It in is first. over two bars, but the second one is more accentuated. Second. That is what gives it more character. You have the call to, give, to, to show you that. <laughs> It's a peasant dance, huh, right? It's a folk dance, the bourrée, as opposed to the gavotte, which is an elegant dance. It's, it's a court dance. That's, these are the categories we should always care for when we play dances. Are there folk, uh, folk dance, uh, peasant dance, or court dance? If you play the menuet, you seek for a certain kind of elegance. The gavotte as well. And the accentuation is more on the on the first bar, whereas in the in, in the bourré, we have accentuation on the second bar. That gives it more character. Can you try that? The, the chord gives you that. It's something very good. You said it's in two. You tend to play when you do. Feel up, down, ta ta tam, ta 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 pa pa, not tam, ta ta tam, pam pa. That's why I do a different bowing than you because. You can do your bowing, it's not a bad bowing, but you have once again to make sure you don't do downbeats everywhere. I don't hear your chord. I don't hear the chord actually. have the bass really sounding. voices mm. 
uh, builds from the base, not from the top. Okay. Can you try that once last time and we will be done for today, I'm afraid. Okay. From the beginning of it? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, make sure you don't play the first bar strong. I still ta da dam ta da da ti ti ta da dam ta da da ti ti ya di da. That's the characteristic. You have that. It's the second bar and the fourth bar, not the first and the third. Okay, I'm afraid we have to go. Uh, we could spend much more time because it's very. You have a lot of uh, uh, lively and interesting things to say with this music, uh, but apparently, time is flying, so we have to. Yes, I'm afraid. I'm afraid time is up uh, on that. So, but thank you very much, Mark, for uh, I'm sure very valuable insight for you, Alina, to take away and 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 uh, work on over over the coming while. So, thank you very much. And uh, just before uh, we move on to our second participant, I'd just like to remind people watching that if you have a question that you would like to work, ask Mark. Uh, please do so via the chat facility on our YouTube and Facebook channels, and we will relay them to Mark at the end of the session. Uh, we're going to have our next participant now, and then we're going to take a very short break, uh, just about three minutes before we move to our third and final participant. So our second participant is, Ka is um, Ka Catherine Cotter, and if she, if, Catherine, if you're there, hi, how are you? Hi. Um, and we are very glad to see you, Catherine. And uh, a, a treat is to have an accompanist uh, who I believe is Marie Therese. So you're very welcome. And thank you for joining us for this masterclass. Mark, I'm going to leave you with Catherine and Marie Therese, and I'll see you in about 40 minutes. Thank you. So, so Catherine, can you hear me? Yeah, hi. Nice to see you again. You uh, see you. So we, and thank you for playing a duo. This is wonderful, very, very good idea to have a piano, a cello without a piano. We feel very lonely often. So um, I hear you're playing Beethoven D major sonata, right? Yeah, the first movement. Good. Maybe without repeat, please. Yeah, without repeat, without repeat, without repeat.
of ni nice things and nice energy in this. Um, to me, the, the, one of the difficulties of this music is that a lot of things are happening in a very short time. You know the different periods of composition of Beethoven. You're familiar with what we usually call his youth, his, the middle, middle part of his life, and, and the rather later. Yeah. You, you, you have a clear picture of this? Um, I have an idea. <laughs> Sorry? I, I have an idea. Okay, that's, that's quite important because in the case of the cello sonatas, we are quite lucky because we have two sonatas from his youth. You see the characteristic of the two first sonatas are quite long. The first movement are long, they have long developments. So it's not as we think, you know, short when it's young and long when it's when it's old. It's not necessarily as simple as that. We have a uh, which is much more of his mature style as relating to the violin concerto, for instance, or the, or the famous uh, piano concerto, such as the fourth and the fifth the emperor, or the beloved fifth, sixth symphonies. So this yeah. is the most famous and maybe easier Beethoven to reach. And then we have the later part. And, and the later part of his life, before he goes on to the long sonata, such as the opus uh, Amer Clavier, 106, which is quite long, or the late quartets, which have different lengths. But there is this moment in his life where he goes with a completely different approach of the music. Very strong contrast, extremely intense music, but in a very short and in a, uh, timing. You have that also okay. in the F minor quartet. You know that quartet? I've, I've heard it, I haven't played it. Do we call it a, f a, f a theme, really? Yes, why not? But we see that uh, this is more a motive than a, than, than, than a theme. And then the, the second time, a theme is uh, one of the characteristics of this moment of Beethoven life. It's something you find also in other music, other pieces of, his, of, 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 the, of, of the Beethoven repertoire, but especially in this moment of his life, the contrast between the first theme and the second theme is huge. Yeah. But it's short, we, so we might not notice, notice it. We might be taken by the energy of the, mu the music, the tempo, and so on. and and we don't necessarily realize that in the unity of that movement, you have extremely contrasted elements. This is where yeah. I'm going to. You have <laughs> and this is not only different, this is opposed. Yeah. Like this. It's fighting in a way. These are fighting element. So, in my humble opinion, that requires different tempi, different everything. I don't believe we can play that movement with the same unique tempo from beginning to end. Yeah. I would think that the tempo relation, so it's, I know it's a dangerous subject because everybody's, oh my goodness, changing. Get lost and it's going to... Sorry, can you just repeat that? I can't read. I say it's, it's, it's a tricky subject. Many people would say, oh, you should never change tempo. This is very dangerous. You have one tempo. And no, 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 no. I don't think so. You have to be careful with the tempo relations. Yeah. But there's much more freedom than what you do, I would believe. Yeah. It starts with the... What is this, actually? That's sorry? Sorry, sorry, what? As opposed to the beginning, is it the same thing, the same element? Are you actually continuing the piano? Um, I thought it was more kind of an, an introduction 
to the kind of warmer. But it has a name in a way. I would think it's called a cadenza. Yeah. This is the, the very uh, particular Beethoven approach. Usually cadenzas are at the end of the movement. Mm -hmm. I was putting them, putting them in the beginning of movement. Remember uh, Emperor Concerto starts with a cadenza. Yeah. Or when you do... This is a cadenza. So in a way, this is maybe not quite a cadenza, but an element of cadenza. See, it doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be exactly in the same tempo. Yeah. Too different to be played in this continuity. So I'm sure you, you feel the, the, these differences of element, but I think the, the, the question is to, to make them understand, understandable for the listener. Can we try this? Uh, yeah. From the very start? Or... <laughs> Better. And the, the thing also about the tempo, he doesn't write Allegro Molto. No. He writes Allegro con brio. Doesn't have to be too fast. That's very fast. Yeah. You see? And you have to have an extremely strong transformation of sound between and Yeah. It's cantabilizing, right? Can you try with a lot of sound on this first note? And feel the transformation. Yeah. It's not only a diminuendo, it's a transformation of everything. You become somebody else in a way, right? Yeah. Not too fast. That's rushing. Now I'm going to ask you to start to, to stop on the beat and to hear the harmony there is on that beat. Yeah. <laughs> we need a lot of that dissonance. Yeah. Possible on the screen to know exactly the balance between you. I'm, I'm not going to bother with you with that, of course, but but just play the B with the first chord. Hello? And what do you expect? Yes. You have a strong expectation of that resolution. And that yeah. is going to decide for your sound. That's also something I think in the timing, in the tempo. The harmony is also deciding for the tempo. Not just a rhythmical thing, but there is an interaction between the harmony and the tempo. We have to understand and hear those details. These are not details. This is not yeah. a detail, this is essential. So, and be free. This is still part of the cadenza. La from there. That interval. Yeah. 
speak those notes, sing those notes. <laughs> Now start something. You see, why am I saying all these things? I'm trying not to be too subjective about it. It's just the way the, the piano and the relation between the cello and the piano is giving us element of how to play things. Is there a lot of things in the piano part against your freedom? Uh, no, not really. Not really. So, be free. Yeah. Beethoven gives you all the time you want to be uh, to be singing. Now, now we have. Another story is starting. Yeah. So this difference of composition should influence your relation to rhythm, timing, expression, and so on. Uh, will I go from the same place? <laughs> Expressive enough. Uh, this is an appoggiatura. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. When you have a chromatism. It's not. It's. You see? It's not a little thing, a D sharp in D major. Yeah. Can you imagine how, how dissonant it is? Mm -hmm. In general, what do we do with dissonance? Resolve it. Sorry? Uh, resolve it. Yes, but play the dissonance more. That's what oh. I mean. In order to resolve it. Uh, feel this. Can you try? It's also difficult to know the, the dynamics, but when you have a, a, a crescendo, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, don't yeah. make the crescendo before it starts. It's rather nice to do it afterwards. Yeah. And the crescendo is being very much decided by the piano. Right? Yeah. Right. To build it with the piano. Much better. So, feel the freedom of this beginning. That's important to understand when you appear. Not particularly free. Yeah. We have a strong feeling and a strong consistency of the of the pulse. Da -da 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 -da. All these motifs, they have to have a strong rhythm. But as opposed to this moment of lyricism, which have nothing to do with being rhythmical. That doesn't mean we don't have a tempo, that doesn't mean we do whatever we want, but there is a sense of lyricism and freedom. Yeah. D major, do you know a famous piece by Beethoven in D major? Uh... 
or several pieces of it? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> Another one, even more famous than that, maybe the most famous ever tune ever written. The Fifth Symphony, that's... Oh my god, oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> you see? Yeah. But this is the key and the lyricism of joy. Yeah. So... That's what I meant. It's so short. It's compressed in this movement. So it's very difficult to, to do, but it is there. Mm -hmm. And if you think of the second movement. Mm -hmm. In D minor with the. This, uh, mm -hmm. the, the middle part, which is in D major again. Yeah. This opposition between life and death, in a way. And the, and the fugue. Beautifully and gloriously in D major, right? Yeah. Can we do? Yeah. Well, one bar before. Tom, ti, ya, ta, ta, ta. Yes, okay, that's it, much better. Now you are starting to oppose. When yeah. you play, you, you made it much, much more different, and that's very nice. And you see that you have to take a bit of time. Those intervals have yeah. to be seen, and they require that. All this in a basic tempo, of course, but you have space. And I think you're playing a little bit slower than before, which I like better, because uh, of course it has to be uh, everything but slow, but it has to sound with power, a bit like yeah. orchestra writing. Can you do that? Can you make that bass sound? And then you free it. Yes. It's a catch release. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. It's difficult uh, on the computer, but feel pressure on the string and then you release. Pam, pam, pam. You see the pam, pam. So you punch and you, and you release. Yes. And not too elegant. This is yeah. not, a, this is not a, you know, French 18th century music. It sounds like an elegant motif, except that it's more, almost brutal. <laughs> If I do, that's too elegant for that music. Yeah. Uh, will I go from there, yeah? Yes. <laughs> yes, okay, so with tam pa pam and tiam pa pa. This is where the contrast goes. Yeah. Tiam pa pam. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
It's too much the same between you two. When you do... It is a musical conversation. And yeah. obviously you don't agree. Or maybe it's not, not agreeing, it's just seeing things differently or arguing a little bit or having a conversation. <laughs> Minor, A major. Yeah. From here, from the piano. Oh yeah, this bar uh, twenty-two. It's very good. Can you try to play that theme once slowly? And try to, uh, apart from any tempo question, what sound do you want on that motif? Yeah. Can you try that alone? Me, la, do, me. seems to be quite beautiful from from here do you do you change something um i think i was just kind of doing a wider sort of rato yes and what about the contact of the bow with the string um more hair and i think i was using more bow as well and wouldn't you go a little bit more to the bridge uh yeah Full sound. It's a piano, but it's a lyrical piano. It's not. Yeah. It's more. A singing bow, right? So make sure every uh, single motif you pick up the sound you want, apart from any uh, tempo thing. If you play the E, for instance, over there. What kind of contact do you develop there? Yeah. Yes. Okay. This is the sound you want? Yeah. Exactly. So it, it, you have to take that time of establishing a sound quality, a texture of sound, um, which is um, really different. And for that, we need time. The same way if I play the, same, the first time, the first uh, lyrical moment. You see, to, to really choose a voice. Yeah. Exactly the one you want. And often when we play too fast, we have no time to do that. So of course, you need time to practice that slowly and keep the memory of that when you play in tempo. OK? Um, Uh, from Sorry. Make sure, no, it's 
it's all right. Uh, 40. And I would go not too much at the frog. So that you can use more bow. Okay. And look what what is the good place of the, the bow to play piano here. Can you play the piano? You want to play, right? Yeah. If you play at the frog, you are going to play too loud. Yeah. Make sure you play every motif at the right spot. And then frog again. Change accordingly to the dynamics, right? So from here. Make sure you don't play uh, aggressively. It is strong, but it should be uh, not vertical. You, of course, you need some uh, clear attack, but also warmth of sound, right? Go ahead. Yeah. So you really play the basic same amount of bow for every one of these notes. I often have the first one, but the ta 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 ta. Not just the first one. Okay. Yeah. The same when you we need four of them. Yeah. La da da Dots or staccato, he writes it. So, yeah. uh, it up a, a beautiful uh, cello bass sound. Even if it's piano, right? The rather start on the C string there. And it's forte. Go a little bit to the bridge to have more depth of the stuff. Also because we, we we expect the piano la di da di di la de di la da go to lead to the entrance of the piano from here uh, Can you make difference between 
when there's sforzatos and when there's no sforzatos? Because there's no sforzato. It's a long line. Now. You see, I, I believe, uh, you know, the beautiful, uh, sorry, there's something that's, um, my, um, there's a phone that starts working because of the vibes of the music. Uh, so, you know, if you think of orchestra, if you think of double bass, the way they would play this, right? Yeah. Not vertical. Can you try that alone? Yeah. Hello. Even the first note, with a lot of darkness and depth. Yeah. The, the, the sound like we have a surface sound. We want the deep sound. There's a very nice thing, we, we can't say that in French, but in, in English you say to dig, right? Yeah. To dig in the string. Feel the, the, the surface, this is the string, right? But the surface of the string is like if, it, if, it, you, if you could go below that surface. The same with the bow, you feel this, and not the pressure actually, you see? It will give you much more sound, try that. And a little bit, maybe a little bit less pressure and a little bit more speed. Something like this. And feel the long note. These are not short notes. You play it a bit like if there were dots. Do, da da da. Do, da di di, tu, ya da di. These are long tempo notes. Fantastic. You see? What character musically does it have, this thing? What would you say the character is there? Sorry? What would you say the character of this is? Um. It's quite kind of... Are we in the conbrio? No, it's, it's kind of more muted and a bit more kind of dark. It's dark, exactly. So you see, this is what I wanted to show you because we, we don't have so much time, and, but you're very musical and very, very quick catching important and not easy things, by the way. This is not easy, especially with this. Uh, this <laughs> uh, so you see, you have a tempo, you have a unity, but you see all these different moments. Yeah. And the genius of Beethoven is to connect all this. But the problem is that we could see it as a connected thing and we don't realize that this is made of extremely different elements. That moment is more like the... <laughs> you play the darkest and deepest thing. Nothing to do with, with, with this, you see? So you have to enter every moment of the piece, seeing how contrasted it is. It is, and one of the key, of course, is the is the tonality, the harmony. Yeah. And also for us, cellists, the tessitura. Cello is a fantastic instrument in the sense, and Beethoven knows it better than anyone because of the incredible contrast that there is between this and this. Can you imagine? Yeah. It's like two different voices, a soprano, tenor, and, and a dark bass. And we change completely characters, sound, mood. The challenge is how quick we have to change in the, with this mm -hmm. it, it is it is really It is really challenging. And in that sense, we have to spend a bit more time on every element first, to define every element. 
and then of course you work at connecting them and going and creating a continuity with it. Or the continuity is full of, uh, it's, it is continuous in the case of Beethoven, but uh, it's quite abrupt. This movement yeah. is quite abrupt, right? Okay, this is just what I wanted to, to show you because you are going to do wonderful, but take time and I would advise you not to be afraid of working a bit outside of the tempo thing. Yeah. I know it is dangerous and some people would tell you, my goodness, the tempo. Yeah, but there are different tempos. You know, we have testimonies of people who heard Beethoven, such as Kshelny, for instance, he writes, and he, he says how much Beethoven was changing tempo. Yeah. The tempo doesn't apply in a piece like that to everything the same way. You have to time, you have to take time and of course I'm basically going to play that motif every time the same tempo. But that doesn't mean I have to play with the same tempo exactly. Because if I change it a little bit I, I open to really contrast. Or also what you can think of is, apart from the tempo, the speed, is the, the kind of pulse. Do I play ta da 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 ta 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 Suddenly the, the counting or the, the subdivision of the bar is changing. And that yeah. also will give you more space. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. And see you sometimes for real. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Bye. Thank Bye. you very much, Bye. Catherine. Thank you. Uh, lovely playing and thank you again, Mark. Uh, now we're going to take a very short break. We're just about three minutes of a break, uh, just so people can stretch the legs, get a breath of fresh air. But please don't go anywhere. And if you do have any questions for Mark, please put them into our chat boxes in the Facebook and YouTube pages of the National Concert Hall. So uh, I'll ask just Mark and anyone else to just switch off cameras and audio and we will see you again in about three minutes. Thank you.
Hello. Hello, Mark, and uh, yeah. hello, Alona. Hello. I'm... Yeah, okay, I'm here. Okay, we can all see and hear each other. Good. Good. Um, so, Alona, you're very welcome. I understand you've been having a little bit of difficulty with the internet connection, so uh, hopefully we'll be okay. But uh, if for any reason we encounter any problems, um, we'll just pause and uh, we'll see if we can we can uh, sort them out. OK, so let's just cross our fingers and hope for the best and see how we get on. OK, so all things going well. I'll see you in about 40 minutes. And Mark and Alona, I will leave you for the session. Thank you. Thank you. So hello. Hello, nice to meet you. Uh, so you, you have a uh, Casado, I understand, right? Oh, uh, what? Me? Sorry. You have Casado. Yes, yes. Good. Yes, uh, Casado, uh, first movement. Good. You can go ahead. Okay, so I try to play and uh, I don't know, if you see me freezing or something, just it's all my fault. Yeah. Play the whole thing and we'll talk afterwards.
Obviously, an excellent cellist, and, and, and it's a it's a bit frustrating because the, the the connection is really bad, and I hear you like this. But I can I can tell, of course, that you play very very nicely. Um, can you hear me well? Okay, uh, my concern is about your phrasing in general. I, I it's a fantasia, but that doesn't mean you have no tempo. And that doesn't mean we should not recognize the actual rhythms. You tend to separate phrases a lot. Be free, of course, there is a lot of freedom, but these are still phrases. When you do, for instance, uh... <laughs> I lose the sense of phrase. This is just one phrase. Now another phrase. You stop. I, I hear those stops. Relate, I think, just if you would relate, because you can play very well. That's, it's, I, can, I can tell you're really a wonderful cellist, but relate to what would you, you would do if you sing, or speak, or tell a story, but not to the bow or certain cello things that make you take time but this is not the time of the music you see what i mean we're going to see that in detail the other thing about that movement which i find very important is to clearly we were talking about that in beethoven this is a totally different context of course but identify different elements we have that's the first element then another one and then a third one and then a fourth one you see what i mean and this is building your movement otherwise i'm a bit lost in what you do you, you understand what i mean in terms uh, of course, uh, yeah. that's for, for instance the lyricism of this is very different to this one. These are two singing expressive phrases, but they are extremely contrasted actually. One is dolce, a rather soprano, the other one is tarirari, is dark and, and and like a bass voice is very, very Catalan Spanish, huh? When you see it is not dolce that's dolce but that's not uh, gentle or it has some uh, dark and uh, a little bit uh, what can i say um, this is typical of certain spanish colors of, of uh, colors of the spanish music you see um, you have that in the flamenco, you have that, 
this is not seductive particularly it is more bitter more you see more contrasted not wrong the guitar is a great instrument for that and we have this these harmonies they show us something not as sweet okay so that these are just examples right but establish the characters of every phrase to build more contrast and more um, understanding of the piece. Can we do the beginning? That's much better already. That, that is much better already. Because I'm starting to hear this is one gesture. Even on the first note, I don't think it's so good to stop. It connects more the notes. And the kind of shift also in this music. Not are not too slow. You have to, to have more energy, right? I would say. More risoluto. It's okay, go ahead. It's okay, I didn't say anything. Sorry, I, I think it's just coming a bit later and then I'm not sure if you think sure you're still talking something. I'm sorry. I, I put my finger on my mouth so that you see you're not talking. <laughs> you can play. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that, that's good. Uh, the thing about the vibrato sometimes... <laughs> Put the vibrato with a little bit more energy at the beginning of the notes. That, that is very good relates not only to cello i think sometimes it's good to relate to the guitar this you see without aggressivity but just with this clarity of attacks it has it is a little bit more sharp not aggressive but sharp and make sure we feel the downbeat on the 16th not because of the chord we often hear have the feeling that the, the beats instead of yada da da da, you know, a bit like the Hungarian music, yada da yada da da da. This is also very Spanish to have the short notes on the beat. It gives more power, more dramatic uh, character. Go ahead. You understand what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And the other thing you should be quite clear about is not to confuse what is the melody and what is the bass. When I play, the 
the bass doesn't relate to the melody. It's not. You see what I mean? Or the same. No. These are two voices. Okay. Go ahead. Dolce. You don't play Dolce. This is, you know, to a fifth like this. Once again, this is not Dolce at all. This is a bit hard. Yeah, I think it's uh, after these chords and character, I'm, I feel that I need to change quickly mood and I'm still like this, like, ooh, and then like something very different and my arm is like eh, getting like this and then the, maybe that's why it's not Dolce. Exactly. You have to change completely feeling. Release. You have to change your uh, muscle tension. There, release from the shoulder, that helps. Go ahead. Look at the screen because otherwise you don't hear what I say. Uh, you arrive too, too, too quick on the string. You, the way you prepare is too fast, too nervous. And It is important not to stop the bow before you start. You do. You can have a connection between the preparation. I don't stop. That's the difference. If I do, I come from the string. But when I do this, this is like this. It's like a, a caress. It's not hitting the string. So this, you have to arrive on the string, not stopping. With the tempo you want. Yeah, feel, feel the motion of your arm at the speed of the music, not faster. Yes? Add a beat almost. You do. And this is like light. From.
it's impossible because your internet is uh, I don't hear it cuts it stops you hear me yeah I'm sorry about that no, yeah yeah me to fall it. it's just annoying because I there was a big stop between and so I, I don't anyway so uh, I don't know about the acoustic, but to me, all this uh, Dolce passage is not Dolce enough. So you will think about it. Uh, mm -hmm. that, the mezzo forte here. And your fingering there is it's not good, I think. Yes. Simple. Yeah. Right. And articulate. Articulate when you go backwards. Yes. When you are on the first finger, feel. You see, when you are on the first finger, you do. If your forefinger is here, it's very far from the next position. You have to anticipate. Do you see? Yes, your hand turns back. Your hand stays here instead of turning back. Yes. When you're on the first finger, look. Me, when you play the E, the forefinger can go that way. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because you, yeah. your finger is far. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm go just going to show you a few things because I think it's quite difficult to actually communicate now. Um, so here. <laughs> Also, look at the tempo uh, indication of Casado. Here it is Pomoso. Right? Yeah. Yes. So work, on, work on the tempo relation and once again have a better sense of the continuity of tempo. Rubato doesn't mean no tempo. You know, there is this uh, famous quote by Schumann. He says, uh, the excess of rubato is like a drunk person walking in the street. So this is, I, I have a little bit of feeling you do that when you do. I'm a bit lost. And I'm, I love rubato, don't get me wrong. Huh? And this music requires a lot of fantasia. And I'm sure you will do that very well because you, you understand that very well but try to incorporate a sense of tempo. That's also very important in every music and especially in Spanish music, right? Free, but with a tempo. That means often simply feeding the bar. One, two, three, one, two, three. Yes, so within the bar, be free, but feel the bar. Can you try that? To my ears, to my ears, you are playing quite loud, especially it's more deep than than loud. Right? It is more inside than just outgoing. And when when we play, this is the beginning of a progression. Start piano. Da 
that's the forty. So build up. Yeah. You see? Uh, you want to do that again? Okay. Um. From here. I think, yeah, uh, Nigel um, is saying. Sorry, I think I was... it, it is really complicated. But you got me the main message uh, of trying to, to build things more with the characterization of every element. And yeah, yeah, of the pulse. This is just what I'm missing. Um, and whenever you have ornamentation, also they should be lighter. And I don't have to play them the same sound. All these are actually lighter elements. These are light elements, as opposed to yeah. as opposed to the more lyrical element. You have a lot of ornamentation in this music. Once again, think of the guitar, think of other instruments in the Spanish music, or of course the piano. And in general, have a lighter bow. I don't have to actually play those notes the same way. It's like a bird. Don't, remember, don't forget the most famous Catalan melody. Song of the birds. We have a lot of birds in Casado. Um, and that's basically it. Uh, yes, Mark, I think, uh, to be honest, the, the, the delaying connection is causing all sorts of problems. So, um, I'm exhausted for me too. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry uh, that, that the internet or uh the, the technical side of things interfered with this today so i think we will probably cut the final uh session a little bit short uh because i think it's i think it's very difficult for you mark and also for you alona so our apologies for that some things are beyond our control unfortunately in the current uh way that we are forced to operate um but nonetheless thank you very much for your insights and I think you uh, have, even under difficult circumstances, given Alona a lot of uh, information and a lot to take on board with, with her playing. So thank you very much for that. Um, what I might suggest is that we just have a very short question and answer session. And I think what we will probably do because of the difficulties, we may just ask our participants, uh, Catherine and Alina, to come back and we will just take questions from our participants, and then I think we will uh, we we will close the masterclass if that's okay. So, um, if Catherine and Alina are there, uh, if you'd like to just switch on your hi, Catherine and uh, Alina, I think coming back as well. So let's just uh, to conclude. Um, we uh, usually do a round of questions from our participants. So um i think alina you started first of all playing so uh have you got a question that you would like to ask mark before we wrap up um i have a question about stamina and playing and how how would you practice stamina building up stamina both uh, mentally and physically. What, what 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 practice what sorry stamina like endurance in playing because you get tired a lot well, from like if you're playing a concerto or a whole suite and kind of how would you practice the buildup of stamina in that sense? That's a big question. Um, so one of the things uh, I, I, of course, there are, there's a limit, there's a minimum of 
have you have to train your muscles and your ability to play but if we speak of the left hand for instance specifically the, re the left hand and the cello requires some strength some not to be exaggerated either right um, and in that sense every exercise that the exercise that you can do with double stops and articulation is always good and al al always think that what builds up the strength of the left hand is tension release tension release process so in other words if i press my left hand for 15 minutes i'm not making it stronger i am making it stronger because i do articulated things such as with the idea that every finger is actually lifting up like if you are playing a keyboard or the double stops whatever makes you play double stops and articulate them is strengthening the hand quite a lot you see now in general what makes us tired is the thing that we don't breathe or don't release the energy in the bow for instance and i see that in your bow in a way i see that you press i was telling you that you press quite a lot and you long you don't seem to let the string string the bow and your muscles that all goes together so be aware and i think the main inspiration for that is what we do when we sing for instance if i sing pam 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 le, the m letter means that there is a release you close open your mouth pam 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 and not not ta 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 you see what i mean mm -hmm. so this for instance on the bow is something we imitate between every bow every stroke there is a little release it's not i don't keep the same tension in my arm or on my left hand i let i let the tension go you see what i mean if i don't do that i get tired very very quickly it's a bit like walking on one foot you see if you walk on one foot after a few a few meters you're going to be tired if you walk on two feet and one is resting while the other is working you can work you can walk for hours and the bow and the left hand go the same way if between notes i let go i i don't get tired i don't get tired and i get more power on every note the famous example for instance is Dvorak concerto if you do or if you do if you release slightly before the 216th you have more power on the 16th then that is uh, also a matter of choice of phrasing so try to establish in the phrasing where the two notes are completely connected without any break so they are going to keep the tension going or rather you are letting go between notes does that help you yeah thank you okay and, and the other thing that you can also think of simply in the case of the bow that's what i was trying to sh show you is the incredible difference there is between down bow and up beat and up bow as a contrast between down beats and up beats if i play a down bow i can rest on it if i play an up bow there's more effort more tension and the rhythm is a constant opposition of those two elements or in harmony the tension between the dominant and the release of the of the tonic if you do that is the end of the bar is a tension and the first bar the downbeat is a, is a release you see so feeling the tension 
and the release of the music is also what helps us not get tired. Understand that there are moments of rest in the music. Thank you, Mark. Um, and uh, Catherine, uh, is there something that you would like to, to ask Mark? Um, yeah, I was just wondering, um, well, over the past year, uh, I've been making a lot more recordings um, and I find it quite difficult sometimes to make one or two that I'm fully happy with, especially if it's maybe a longer piece or, you know, a, a few pieces together. I was wondering if you just have any advice on kind of making good quality recordings at home. Well, you mean you were not happy about what aspect? Um, well, I don't know if there was like mistakes in, in a piece or something, just I was finding it hard to get one or two takes that I was fully happy with sending and in for auditions and things. What you call mistake was what kind of mistake? That, that's, I'm asking you because that, that also depends, you see. We have to see uh, what I mean by that is when we try to play through something and there are things we're not happy about, or things we cannot do. Uh, it's not everything that you can do, it's certain things. So in a way, this is teaching you what is weaker in your playing and what yeah. you have to work on. So for instance, is it after, if you play for 15 minutes, something without stopping, what goes off? The sound, the intonation, the memory, uh, the tempo, you see what I mean? What is frustrating for you? Um, well, I think intonation in particular, I okay. find. So if, yeah. if you speak of intonation, is it, now if we go to that, that uh, topic, is it your hand which is not very well placed or is it the shifting that you are missing or both? Kind of both. Okay, so one thing is to understand and place the hand correctly for every position. You know, there are a lot of position on the cello. <laughs> so, and everyone has, every, each, each one of them has a different um, size and interval, right? That's a very uh, easy thing I'm saying that you, of course, are very aware of, but you have to be conscious of the fact that if you do a third here and a third here, they are all the same interval means a different size for the hand. Yeah. You have to learn them all. This is why we do exercises to make sure that it is clear in your brain that the same interval is a different size. But you already know that, of course, but it's just a matter of how much you practice that. For me, the better, uh, the, the two basic things I would say about intonation, simply because, of course, we could spend the afternoon on that, but to be very quick and efficient, is to check intonation with the open strings and harmonic. Never, and never play a note without a relation with another one. Because it's yeah. not in tune or out of tune, it's just the relation between notes that defines the intonation. So check the intonation with open strings and harmonics and work as much as you can on double stops. Yeah. Because this is what is ultimately uh, building the intervals. If I do this, that interval is equivalent, equivalent to this one. But how do I know that interval? Because of this. See what I mean? Yeah. And because of the double stop, you hear this. If I ask you to play this, you cannot play them both at the same time. This you can play at the same time. So you check this. And when you practice double stops, I always advise to break them. Yeah. Because it's very difficult to play right away two notes in tune. So I am going to um, establish the first one. And then the second one. That 
that's how you take time and your brain processes the actually the actual uh, relation between nodes in your hand. The last thing I can say about then about shifting, we could also spend a lot of time, but then this is a different topic. First, you establish the position and, and the, the shape of the hand for every interval. And then you work on connection. Yeah. And connection, it means you have to also be very aware of the bow. If I do... Do you practice shifts both directions? Yeah, yeah, I would do that. Okay, never practice that kind of thing. Never stopping the bow when you shift, when you work on shifts, because you have to work on the control of the motion between positions with the bow going on, because that's what we do when we play, make music. Yeah. So if you feel weakness between two notes, you are not sure of it. You practice this. Example, can I give you? Practice those relations slowly. Yeah. Slowly because you have time to process, hear, feel, and control your gesture. And then you speed up with rhythm. So that you train to be faster, but not everything fast at once. Elements of speed. You see? Mm -hmm. It's like a, a bit building a house, right? I always give the, you know, this, uh, I'm sure you have this story in Ireland as well. The, the three little pigs, no? <laughs> yeah. In my book, when I was uh, a child, I I always preferred the first one, which is in straw. It was it looked very beautiful. It was, <laughs> and it, it was very 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 pretty. But we know what happens. Yeah. And then the second one takes a bit more time, but still not. And the the, the third one maybe it's not as uh, appealing at first, but it's solid. <clears throat> so uh, intonation, position, all these things. That's a little bit what happens. Yeah. And then the when you play in front of your camera, you are afraid, and this is the this is the wolf, the wolf, right, coming and, uh, <laughs> and, and trying to destroy the house. But if the house has been strongly built, then the, you don't care too much about being nervous. Of course, you will. We are all nervous when we play. That's that's a known fact. The question is how the practicing has been build, building up something solid, so in order to for the fear to not really affect you. Yeah. But I always consider that, uh, you know, it's, it's like a, you, you can interp interpret uh, losing control because of stage fright and so in two ways. Of course, it's extremely frustrating, but it's interesting to, to know what it affects in our playing because it doesn't affect everything. For some people, it's intonation. For some people, it's the bow. For some people, it's pulse. You know, and ev yeah. it's not everything. So try to see also what actually stays solid in your playing, and this is what you already build up quite well. And if some elements are weaker, but you know that that's what you have to practice. Yeah. You don't have to practice everything the same way because you know that some things are already there solid. Or more solid. Thank you, Mark. Uh, sound advice again. And uh, finally, uh, Alona, if you have a question you, you would like to ask Mark. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. We, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm just curious if you could tell me if you need to learn some new piece which you never played before. Do you have some kind of a pattern? or something, or something, I don't know, something, some sequence. Um, I'm asking that because I, I just finished my study and um, I found it's hard to um, 
to practice on your own without teacher and just to get all the time inspiration and find new things and go really deep with the piece. If um, like any advice I would uh, appreciate um, from you. Yeah, thanks. Oh, okay. That's a matter of method. So it depends on what we're talking. For instance, I recently played first piece from the piece by a friend composer of mine, which was extremely hard, a lot of notes and uh, 15 minutes of uh, some kind of a motor perpetuo there you just have to spend time learning the notes with all sorts of methods and uh, most of it's uh, working on slowly and building a tempo i mean all, already things that you probably know uh, then if you ask me about uh, a more general approach to, of, of the piece it depends if you mean of if you speak of memorizing it or understanding how it's composed and that kind of a thing uh, I believe that the, the teaching is precisely what should lead you to be independent. Meaning, for instance, what I just uh, replied about the intonation thing. I'm, I'm not. I don't believe that uh, a teacher is somebody to tell you who tells you this is in tune, this is out of tune. It's just somebody who teaches you how to build up your intonation and by uh, information that you can use on your own, such as such as I what I gave right now. Um, and I think it's a little bit the same about building up an interpretation. Then it depends on people how much they think it is it it takes to actually enter the world of a composer. I can tell you, for instance, that if you play if you learn Brahms sonata, it's good to read a book about Brahms. Uh, maybe that's not going to help you learn the sonata, but maybe yes actually because you are going to understand certain things more uh, if we speak about the instrumental preparation of it I've, i think it should never be disconnected from analyzing the text you see what when we spoke about beethoven opus one one or two number two there's nothing that technic technically you cannot do it's not a matter of that the question is try to understand what this music is about so what this music is about you have to know the harmony of the piece. You have to know the, the construction of the piece. For instance, what is the form? It's a sonata form, where is the first theme, where is the second theme, where is the coda, where is the development? You see what I mean? Because these elements, I believe, they also help you memorize and understand what you are doing. In your case, I can tell you, you, you you're a very good cellist, you can play, there's no question about that. So these aspects, which have nothing to do with the cello, but with the music, the way the way the music is built is extremely important, and that you can work with the score. You don't even need your cello or in your head to establish before, sometimes before we play, what we want to do. Of course, you can sight read the, the music, and instinctively you are going to to understand and uh, and quickly probably already uh, identify a lot of issues about an interpretation. But if you want to go deeper into the interpretation, it has to, to do with knowing what you want to do with the piece before you practice it in a way or at the same time. But I, I liked, I was a great admirer of Leon Fleischer, the wonderful pianist, American pianist. And he was saying that an interpret is basically three persons one person who identifies what should be done. That doesn't mean we don't change mind, right? We can change our mind, we can, it's, it's, it's something that is lively, of course, but try to understand the music you are playing. The second person is actually practicing in order to realize what the first person has uh, established, the goals that you have established, what you want to do with the piece. And the third one he was saying is somebody who sits in the hall and a bit further away and try to see if the message that you you have uh, worked on and, and, and identified is being conveyed to the audience, right? So uh, uh, to me, the, uh, the answer of, of Fleischer is quite inspiring for that. If, if, you, if you approach any piece of music, I think this is what we do in a way. Of course, there are communication between the, the three elements I just uh, I just named. But what do you want to do with the piece? Work at doing it and trying to see if 
what you want to do is actually understandable by those who hear you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, and thank you to our participants. Mark, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, it was a very enjoyable session and thank you. And uh, our apologies for the, uh, uh, the problems with the uh, internet connections in the, in the last section. But uh, nonetheless, I think uh, you managed to give uh, an awful lot of very useful information to all of our participants. And it was a pleasure to have you. So thank you. Um, equally, for me too. Equally, our, 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 our wonderful young cellists, uh, Alina, Catherine and Alona, thank you for joining us and we hope you enjoyed the session and I'm sure that we will be hearing a lot more from you in the coming years. Please do keep an eye on our uh, schedule, nch.ie, for uh, the other events in this series. Our next event today uh, is a recital of uh, our artistic directors, Finian Collins and Gwendolyn Mason, and that is going to be streamed live on our YouTube and Facebook uh, channels at 7 p.m. Irish time this evening. So we do hope that you will join us for that. Mark, all our participants, thank you so much, thank and uh, we hope to see you bye. again. Thank you. You too. Bye.